and now it's the opposite. As these fish get ready to feed up and go home, they're coming in really close to the beaches, especially at night. They're sitting by any kind of structure, any place they can pick up any sort of protein, the bass are on it. So fall fishing, your timing is perfect. Fall fishing is really exciting here. Welcome to the Woman Angler and Adventurer Podcast, inspiring real women with a passion for fishing and the outdoors to go get their adventure on. Now, here's your host, Angie Scott and Barb Carey. Hey, welcome to this week's episode of the Woman Angler and Adventure podcast. We're going to be getting you all fired up for striper fishing today. And we're talking about Atlantic East Coast striper, these hard, hard fighting fish, super exciting to catch. If you've not had a chance to fish for striper in your life, it's definitely something you need to experience. And we have just the occasion for you. If you'd like to sign up, we've got a few spots left for our striper fishing clinic, which is going to be taking place Friday, October 11th through Sunday, October 13th. And this is in Cape Cod. If you're in the area, there's no excuse for you not to sign up for this. If you have to travel in for it, it's still not too late. You can definitely find some cheap airfare and some lodging. And we will hook you up with some exciting surf fishing for Striper. We've got two very experienced guides that are going to be teaching us all the basics and everything we need to know for surf casting and what type of knots we need to tie and how to fish for these striper and, and what how these fish behave and all the details. So it's going to be a super informative couple of days. And there's also some opportunities for you to get out and do some other type of fishing while you're there as well. So you're going to hear all about it in this week's episode. We are talking with one of our guides, Todd, and he's super knowledgeable. We had a great conversation with him. Even if you're not able to make it out, definitely listen to this episode. Uh, He's going to whet your appetite for striper fishing for sure. And uh, you're going to learn a lot as well. So we hope you enjoy this episode. And we hope you can join us for the Striper Fishing Clinic in Cape Cod. This is put on by Al's Goldfish Lure Company, the Woman Angler and Adventurer's Sponsor, and Wisconsin Women Fish. And if you want to get registered, you can go to wiwomenfish.com slash events and just click on the Striper Fishing Clinic. From there, you'll see exactly all the the ins and outs of what you need to know and what to bring and how to get registered for that. I wouldn't wait too long. Like I said, we've only got a few spots available, but jump on that. Come join us. It's going to be a blast. All right, sit back and enjoy this episode as Todd teaches us all about striped bass fishing in the Atlantic. Todd, welcome to the Woman Angler and Adventure podcast. I've heard a lot about you. You two are uh, you two are a topic of conversation out here in the East quite a bit. Really, wow. the Al Goldfish people—they're talking to you all oh, big yeah. time. They're awesome. They've they've been great supporters of our show, and so we try to reciprocate. I had, I had a tournament yesterday, and so we weren't it, the the. It was a bass tournament, and it was horribly slow. Like the water's super low. I think they drained drained the the system because they were afraid of flooding from the hurricane, which didn't happen. Sure. So we couldn't get into any of the creeks. There was like one we could get into, and um, you know, it, it was just slow. It was I don't know. The bass were probably scattered or whatever. And anyway, I took out my Al's goldfish. I'm like, you know, nothing else is working. <laughs> Might as well try it. You know, and sure enough, I caught one it, uh, pretty quickly, and it was it was a little short. It didn't. I couldn't weigh it in, but um, still, it was something. I was I was excited. It was pretty cool. So, we we definitely try to support them as much as possible. They've been awesome. So great people. I agree. I could not agree more. Yeah. So. Uh, so how can I help you? So we want to do a little episode on the the Cape Cod striper fishing clinic that we're doing. I am developing a passion for striped bass fishing very, very quickly. <laughs> I, uh, I, I took a guide out here on Percy Priest is where I'm at in Nashville, and they have a lot of hybrids mostly, but a few striped bass. And um, 
I mean, it was so much fun. I was like, I grew up fishing walleye, and I'm like, this oh, is, yeah. there's no walleye in Percy Priest. So, like, to me, this is, like, the next best thing, if not even a little better. I mean, these things fight so hard, and that's why I fish. I'm I'm all about the fight. And uh, we went out uh, Friday. I took uh, a friend of mine that's kind of gotten into striper fishing on Cumberland River. And even the little ones just fought so hard. And I'm like, this is it. This is I'm all in now. I want to learn everything. I want to I want to become the the striper and hybrid fishing expert on my lake. And uh, it was just a blast. So I can't wait to to get into it. And I know what we're going to be doing is probably a lot different um, because we're going to be surf fishing and um, and I'm I love surf fishing, too. So uh, if you know, tell us a little bit about striped bass and then the type of fishing we're going to be doing because this is this is like east coast striper that we're going after so it might be a little different than other parts of the country well i believe that the fish you're catching are the same species mm-hmm. um, Mar- maroon saxatillus is is the striped bass and i believe you're just catching the the hybrids because by nature, striped bass are anadromous. They, you know, they live in the ocean, but they go into fresh water to spawn. I, I think you're catching the hybrids that have just acclimated to living in fresh water. And I bet they're a hoot to catch because, I mean, if they're still the same, if it's the same fish as ours, you know, like you said, there's a heck of a fight there with them. Uh-huh. And they have very strong heads. I mean, they just want to take off. And a lot of times the, the bigger fish, the smarter fish will... Once they feel that hook in their mouth, they, they try to go to the bottom and they rub their heads against the rocks or any kind of structure to push that hook out. They're really smart, which is usually why people, you know, snap a line at that point. Or if they're fishing with braid, it it, it, um, it comes apart because the fish are running their heads hard against rocks or, or gravel or anything to get that hook out. Yeah, smart, smart fish. fish. Yeah, <laughs> wow. I just thought they were just mean, you know, but... Uh... <laughs> But uh, that uh, well, they have to be very aggressive because you probably noticed they don't have any teeth. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, they can't. A lot of like a lot of fish will take a bite out of something and then and then chew it up. These guys have to basically inhale fish because they don't have any teeth to chew it up. So they're definitely a very when they hit, they're very aggressive because they don't have those teeth to back them up. Now, when you, when you handle them, though, um, the guy that I went out with here recently, he said he's. He doesn't like to put his hand in their mouth because he's he sliced his thumb on something. Do you know what that would be? Is there anything in there that's sharp? I guess maybe just the gills. Yeah, it depends on where you grab them. They do have a little bit of abrasive feel on their on their um, mouths, but they're not teeth. You know, there's no calcium teeth there. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, I suppose you could you could rough your finger up a little bit, but generally up here, when you get a big fish, that's unless it's a really big fish. You basically just put your thumb right in his mouth and put the rest of your hand under and you can pick them right up because okay. they can't bite you back. Right. <laughs> so you get the hook out. <laughs> cool. So are oh, they size wise, like are for what we're going to be doing, are, are we going to be expecting to catch some of size or how big do they run typically? Yes. We are at the very beginning, especially with this storm that just went through. Um, and as the, as the days get shorter, not all, but most of the bass up here are going to head south to the Chesapeake and the, and the Hudson River. They migrate back to fresh water to go spawn. There's a big population that stays. I call them the lazy fish, but they mm-hmm. tend to go up the rivers, and they'll spend the whole winter here feeding on crabs and uh, little menhaden, river herring, anchovies, whatever they can find in the rivers. But most of the population is getting ready to head south. And to do that, their DNA tells them they got to eat and they got to eat a lot because it's a long swim back to the Chesapeake. So we, you know, we call it the fall migration. The, when the fish are up in the spring, the fishing is red hot because the fish are generally younger. They've come up from the Chesapeake. They're hungry. They're feeding hard. Then by the middle of the summer, waters get warm or real warm. They tend to go deeper. They're not as aggressive. Fishing's good, but it's not as great as, you know, when they first arrived. And now it's the opposite. As these fish get ready to feed up and go home, they're coming in really close to the beaches, especially at night. They're sitting by any kind of structure, any place they can pick up any sort of protein, the bass are on it. So fall fishing, your timing is perfect. Fall fishing is really exciting here. 
That's okay. awesome. Now, yeah, so this is something that you, you stand on the shoreline in, or in the water in your casting form, and so you don't need a boat. That's kind of a huge benefit for a lot of people. And uh, so is it just constant cast and then retrieve a variety of lures, or how does, it, how does that work? You're, you're spot on. Depending on where you live in New England, if, like, we have a lot of rocky shorelines near me. You don't even need waders. You can stand up on the rocks. Most guys, it's an immersive sport. You know, it's, it's like surfing. You, you got to get the baptism. You got to get in the water. And it's more, um, I think it's more enjoyable when you're in the water to pair of waders. But depending on your location, you don't really need them in most places. It's, uh, it's like any other kind of fishing. You know, if I came up walleye fishing with you, you there'd be all kinds of um, tips and tricks you could teach me. Out here, it's a feel for what's in the water, what the conditions are, how much moonlight there is. That all those factors and those environmental factors affect what lure you use. Generally speaking, we're going to start using big splashing lures, you know, bottle plugs, dannies, needlefish, anything that makes up. Bass, like most fish, have a very distinct lateral line that runs down their side, and that lateral line is rich with receptors. So any kind of vibration, low level noise, high pitch noise, those fish key right in on it. So a lot of the plugs will either make a big splash as they go, or they'll have little rattlers in it to make a vibration. And the fish will, a lot of times they'll key right in on it and they'll turn around from wherever they were going just to go attack the thing. So it's, it's a lot of fun. And it, especially Eddie's an awesome fisherman. When he puts us on some spots, some of those plugs will splash at the surface. And that is an absolute, I mean, if you, if you freshwater bass fish, you know what it's like to fish little poppers and, yeah. and you know, surface bugs, you watch a 10 or 15 pound bass come out of the water. I mean, you, a lot of times what they do is they slap it with their tail first because they want it because like I said, they don't have any teeth. A lot of times they'll try to knock the fish out or stun the, the bait and then go eat it. So you'll be, you know, pulling a plug, pulling a big Danny or something. And all of a sudden you see this, Bam, that thing splashes out of the water and your lure goes flying. And, you know, that's, I imagine your heart will stop like the rest of us. You know, <laughs> no matter how old you are, or how many fish you've caught, your heart still stops for a second. You go, oh my God, there it is. And, uh, oh, so it's a wow, that it's, it's a great. very fun fishery. It is. And they, you know, like you were saying earlier, once they get that hook in their mouth, they're just like, no way, no way, I'm not coming in. And they, <laughs> they fight hard in the other direction. So what kind of line should pe people be putting on their lines to get ready for that? A lot of well, there's braid and mono. Um, I tend to fish a lot of braid unless we're going to fish around rocks. Um, several years ago, I lost what probably would have been the biggest bass of my life. Mm -hmm. And I had it on for, I don't know, 10 or 15 seconds, and it went around a rock, and the, and the braid parted, and I lost a bomber of a fish. And... Ever since then, if there's any sort of rocks around, I only use um, mono because it has much better abrasion resistance. 20 to 30 pound is about right out here for both um, mono and braid. I have a couple rods with 50 on it only because the braid doesn't, it's, you know, it's a, a fraction of the diameter that mono is. So I can run 50 pound braid in less space than I can run a spool of 30 pound mono. So, you know, why not? There's a leader out in front. Usually it's fluorocarbon in the, depending on the kind of fish, if they're schooly sized fish, which are up to maybe five or eight pounds, 10 pounds, you can use 15 pound fluorocarbon. I tend to use 20 or 30 pound for the, for the surf rods because it doesn't, it doesn't really add any weight. It's not really cumbersome. And you hook yourself into a 20 pound bass and you lose it because you only use 15 pound fluorocarbon, you know, and you saved yourself. 40 cents <laughs> you should be feeling pretty right. stupid because you should have just gone with the with the bigger so generally like 20 to 30 pound far carbon for a liter hmm. we'll show you all that too i mean we'll show you all that stuff it's pretty straightforward so i have a question how you, you said how the fish dive down to the bottom and kind of run the line on the bottom or the rocks is do you try to hold up keep the fish up from doing that or do you just pray for the best both. <laughs> you always pray for the best. <laughs> uh, yes, you you want to you want to keep the tension on that fish because they'll do anything to shake that hook. Mm -hmm. um, and they so you're constantly once you let off, if you take a break for a second, generally they're gonna whip their head around and and get that hook out. 
even if they tear it out. So yeah, the, it's, it's, it's a battle. It really is a battle. You're, um, you know, you say like that, you're all about the fight. It, mm-hmm. You have to stay with them or they'll, they'll shake it out. Especially the big ones that are smarter. Do you have to, like, if they want to run though, do you kind of need to let them, let them run or how, how does if that you, work? You, oh yeah. If you look into a, a bigger fish and you, you, you've got, you know, a 20 or a 30 pounder, you've got a real fish. They're not, they don't have a lot of, um, long-term strength. You can wear them out. And that's a tactic where you still keep tension on the line. Mm-hmm. You still keep everything taut, but you can wear them down. And generally, you know, you get a bigger fish like that. By the time you get them to the beach, they've, they've had it. They're pretty, they're pretty pooped. Mm-hmm. And releasing them. I know, I know here in the, in the freshwater anyway, they're pretty sensitive fish. Like you have to handle them really quickly and especially in the summer, not so much in the winter. Uh, are they as sensitive in the saltwater? Yes. They're, if, if you catch a good sized fish and you've worn it out and you've worn yourself out, you know, getting it to the boat or to the rocks, you, you want to, once you get the hook out and of course, you know, in the age of the cell phone, everybody's got to take the fish and cell thing. So once, <laughs> once the fish pictures are done, you really want to get them back in and you hold them with two hands, which we can show you one hand in their mouth, one in their tail. And you just sort of let them sit there till they get their act together till they, you know, their heart gets going they're they kind of stabilize and they'll like, a, like you do with the trout. You just sort of let them sit there, and then um, some guys will, will brush them back and forth in a little S pattern to get the water through their gills. Years ago, people used to try to like force water into them to sort of jumpstart their heart, and that's actually bad because you're, over, you're overcompensating mm. for them. You just basically hold them in the water, let them cradle in your hands for a minute or two, and generally they'll swim right off. Um, you know, if you, get a, if you get a good-sized fish that you've caught in deep water, you know, 50, 60, 70 feet of water, you want to give them that time because it's a shock coming back up to the surface like that so quickly. Mm-hmm. That was one thing I learned uh, when I went out fishing the other day is that they really, they really need a lot of current because they need that the, the oxygen, I guess, and the the water running past them uh, pretty much at all times. They don't just sit still like like bass will just sit suspended, you know, like regular loud, largemouth bass, but these fish have to be moving pretty much constantly or, or have some current flowing, um, which I thought was interesting. That's absolutely true. Yep. They're very dependent on oxygen. They'll use, not only do they need to consume it, but they also will use oxygen, which is, will be in our benefit on the Cape. They'll use the, the white bubbles of oxygen in the surf to, that's why a lot of times guys will catch big fish in three feet of water because they're using that crashing surf and those waves because they know the little bait fish are all messed up trying to figure out where they are and they'll cruise right through there with their eyesight and pick off bait in very shallow um, water that's full of foam and bubbles so that it's, you know, it's a, it's a, it's an aggressive method for them as in, in addition to keeping them alive. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's another reason to get them back in the water quickly. They, they can't tolerate being out of the water very long. Well, one of the things I'm excited to to learn, hone in, because I've done some surf fishing, but I don't really know what I'm doing. I just, I'm on vacation in Florida or whatever, and I'll pick up a cheap surf rod, you know, and, and uh, I just throw it out there as hard as I can. And um, so we're actually going to learn the techniques to, to surf casting, which I'm really excited about. Um, are there any, like quick tips or something that you could share uh, for list- other listeners that might not be able to join us on this trip, but uh, like, like me, you know, might like to try surf casting on vacation. I think the first key is that if someone's going to get into, into start bass fishing with a surf rod is generally the rods are 10 feet long, generally nine and a half, 10 feet. Some people will fish in 11 or bigger, but they tend to wear you out. Um, TFO, Temple Forks Outfitters came out with a rod a couple of years ago that only weighs six ounces and it's 10 feet long. Oh, wow. It's, you, you get a big fishing rod, you put a big reel on it, you put a lot of line on it, and then you put the hardware and the, and the leader, and then you put on a big Danny or a big bottle plug that weighs ounce, several ounces. It's a lot on your body. It'll, you know, you, you don't, you're not used to working with your hands over your head for a couple mm-hmm. hours that it's, those are different muscles. So you wear yourself out pretty quickly. I think a lot of it is getting a lighter, as light a rod as you can, as you can mm-hmm. afford or, you know, um, you can find because you just don't want to get 
you don't want to spend all that money to get out there and spend all that time and energy and then get worn out after half an hour. Surf casting is a blast to stand waist deep in the water and throw this big rod and watch these watch the plugs go across the surface and then bring the fish right up to you. It's a blast. You'll love it. Awesome. Is it kind of you just try to throw it as far as you can or is there uh, like a target distance that you want to try to get it out there? Bass will feed anywhere anywhere in the water calm, depending on where the feed is and where the tide is. So mm-hmm. like I said before, you, it's not unusual to catch a big fish in three feet of water. Bass, are, they're dependent on oxygen, but they're also very conservative in their energy use. They're kind of they're kind of lazy. <laughs> They'll find a spot in the rocks, and yes, they're moving, and yes, the current is going over them. But they will a little bit like a largemouth. They'll sit and wait for the bait to come to them. So if wherever we end up fishing, if if there's some structure around, we'll be casting for the rocks because mm-hmm. behind that rock is where the big bass will sit, waiting for a little anchovy or something to go by. Um, if we when we fish on the straight shoreline on straight beach then generally, yes, that's where the ounce goldfish will be killer because at the ounce or ounce and a quarter, ounce and a half, you can pass that thing a country mile. Yeah. And that's what you want because then you can really cover some distance. Um, bass also have excellent, excellent eyesight. So sometimes, so you cast maybe 50 yards and you're almost back to, you've almost got the lure back into your hand and that's when the fish will strike because they've been behind it the whole time watching trying to figure mm-hmm. out if it's real, if they can eat it, if it's a lure, if it looks like a big hunk of plastic from Walmart. <laughs> They're figuring it out. And a lot of times, you know, that old expression, you know, fish to the boat. A lot of mm-hmm. times when you're in a kayak or canoe, you know, you go to pull the rod and pull the, the lure out of the water, and that's when the fish hits. That's the bat. They've been, they will be watching it. So with that Alice Goldfish, we'll cast that thing out as far as we can off the beach, and then hopefully that the between that point and the, and the beach, the bass will figure out that it looks good and whack it. Awesome. Yeah, I love casting those Ells Goldfish lures. I'd, but I have to be careful if I'm bass fishing, like, you know, up against a bank or something, because it's hard not to throw it too far, get it stuck in the trees or on the shore or something. <laughs> but I, and, I, and you look up at your $5 hanging in the tree. <laughs> exactly, yeah. But I love the feel of being able to just, without hardly any effort, and that thing just goes flying. It's awesome. We'll show you um, you and everybody some, some basic knots because that's, you know, your terminal tackle and your knots are pretty key. There is nothing, there's there's no, it's like the sound of a car crash, you know, that's a very distinct sound. There's no sound like the sound of a line breaking when you make a huge cast. Mm-hmm. Sometimes if you don't get the line off the bail properly and you make this whipper of a cast and you throw this thing as far as you can and you hear it, snap. And you watch your 20 bucks just fly, fly, fly to the biggest cast of your life. So we'll I've been there, done that. I know that feeling. <laughs> it's, it's usually followed by a swear. <laughs> Great. It's usually some Great. swearing after that. I lost, I was fishing thir- Thursday night off of Newport, um, where I live, and, uh, and I lost a good sized fish. And the braid part, I don't know how it did it, but somehow the braid broke, and I lost probably an 18 or $20 plug and I lost a good sized fish. So, oh, you know, it happens, but we'll, we'll show you all some knots that'll hopefully prevent that. So a lot of the gals that are coming out to that are from, uh, you know, Wisconsin, Minnesota, some Midwest States, and they're not, you know, this is all going to be brand new to them. They're most of them are experienced anglers, but you know, many of them have never done anything like this before. So what should they bring? I mean, they're bringing their surf, the surf rods are going to be there. Is there anything else that uh, they should be bringing that they can get in the Midwest that would be applicable for what we're going to be doing out there? Yes. Um, Fleece, fleece vests or a fleece um, pullover. Um, wool socks. You definitely, because when you put on waders and boots, I'm sure I'm from Wisconsin, you know, it's like to be cold. You, you definitely want to wear wool socks just to be comfortable. Because you, if you're going to stay in the water for a couple hours, you, you want to be, you know, you want to be comfortable and cozy. Brings, I would say, extra fleece because you can always take it off as it warms up or put something back on easily, especially in waders. You know, a fleece vest or a pullover or something. Um, and the fleece also sheds water a little better. If you wear a, a, a traditional sweatshirt, you know, a hoodie, when they get wet, they take forever to dry out. Whereas fleece will breathe a little better, and you know, if you get your sleeves wet or something, it'll it'll dry off a little quicker. 
gloves if you have them, you know, um, fingerless gloves or the kind with, with um, your index finger open. But that's not critical. It's not going to be freezing cold. It's going to be gorgeous. But sometimes, especially if you start in the morning, it's good to have a pair of gloves. Um, a knife, if you have one. I'm a big fan of um, having a knife on my waders. I keep one on the on my suspenders of the waders. God forbid something goes sideways when you're out fishing at night. It, it's a wicked last case scenario. And this kind of situation with all with all these anglers, it's not really a concern. But and actually, now that I say that, you probably won't be able to fly with one anyway. But I like having a knife on my suspenders in case it gets weird. I can cut my pants off and you know get out of them. But um, I would the, I would throw up some wool socks and some fleece mm-hmm. and uh, and a camera. <laughs> Because we're going to catch some fish. Awesome. That's pretty exciting. Now, I've heard that, uh, what's what's the whole, um, like, catch and release versus harvest? I hear, I read somewhere that they're delicious table fare. But I've also, you know, heard that the, you know, the species is kind of being taxed and that really recommend uh, catch and release. What's the scoop on that part of the event? Well, the law says you can keep one fish per day bigger than 28 inches. That is likely to change. The uh, Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Council is doing some work right now. There's some proposals out for public comment right now. I, Because of the amount of writing I do about fishing and the amount of time I spend badgering people to be good at the fish, I try to keep one fish a year. That's my That's been my goal. The last couple of years, I've only kept one fish. Straight bass is delicious. It's a it's a fine fine fish. We try to tell people larger fish are generally females. They change sexes in about their second or third year, as I recall. So if you catch a twenty five pound bass, it's almost one hundred percent that's a female. And we want those fish back in the water. We um, taking the twenty and thirty and forty pound fish are the ones you're taking all the eggs out of the, out of the system. And we really don't want that. Um, generally, the fish are 10, 5, 10, 12, 15 pounds, something like that. The larger fish can have a couple hundred thousand eggs in them. So if you, I would encourage people that if we catch a 30 pound bass, we take a million pictures and we do a, a dance around the beach and, and then we put it back because we really need those fish to, to go back to the Chesapeake and spawn again. Um, that said, yeah, like yeah. I said, the other side of it is they taste delicious. That's so it's a really, really fine fish to eat, and they don't take much to prepare them. They have a very distinct flavor, especially fresh. Um, I, I mean, I, I could eat it all the time if I, well, if I could catch one. <laughs> 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 Just to drive home the point that an adult female fish could hold three hundred thousand eggs in a year. That's wow. something to think about before you haul it up in the beach and carve it open. The, the oh, five, yeah, ten I mean, pound it, fish tend to be males, and that's you know a little less. The, the fishery is being stressed. The federal government has finally admitted that in their nomenclature, the fishery is overfished, and overfishing is occurring. That's how the government twists it. So there are big changes coming, and hopefully they will increase the size and change the bag limits, and hopefully all the states will work together, which is nearly impossible. But when we catch some fish. There's nothing wrong with taking fish for dinner. The, the fishery is not in a state of collapse. We're just, lots of people are working aggressively to ensure that does not happen. But there's nothing wrong with taking some fish home. And I hope we, well, I hope we can catch some fish that we can um, take back and cook and have a blast because they are delicious. Yeah, yeah. Well, we're excited. I know that. It's kind of something that uh, nobody that is going, I think, has ever really done much of that. Now, do you recommend hauling waders out? Is it necessary? If they don't have them, should they buy them? What's the waiter situation? I believe most of what we're going to fish is Sandy Beach. So the weather should be pretty temperate. You can probably fish in shorts or, um, you know, knee boots or something. Waders just gives you that extra four or five feet. As I said earlier, it's more immersive. It's more fun. I think it's more fun to be in the water. But it, it will not be a prerequisite. It will not be totally necessary. We can we can work around that. And if someone did decide that they really want to experience that, we'll either put them in a pair of ours or you know we'll, we'll find them a pair of waders. And I'll bring. I probably have three or four pairs. I'll I'll bring waders with me too, so people can use those. They're pretty. Um, the sizes are pretty general. You know, anybody 
generally can fit into a pair of waders. So I'll, I'll bring some extras with me. Cool. Yeah, I know. I'm bringing mine. I'm bringing my surf rod and my waders just because that's where you buy that stuff. And I'll, I'll pay <laughs> for the extra it. baggage. Yep, I'll pay for an extra bag to have my <laughs> good waders out there. What we're going to do in the in the show notes, we'll make sure we post the link to register, and then we'll keep uh, uh, people. Uh, we'll keep updating and give other information that comes in, and um, you know, we'll post links to where they can register if anyone hearing this wants to go. And uh, I, I'm really excited, and and we do have one gal from, who lives out in Boston that's been wanting to do something like this for a long time, so she signed up and. A lot of the others are the Midwest gals, but uh, I know that we wanted to have the group size very small, you know, and we do have some other stuff that's incorporated in there too. I think that there's uh, going to be an optional trip on one of those uh, boats that go out that take about 60 or 70 people and they fish for blackfish. Yeah. Blackfish. Oh yeah, it is. Sure. Yeah. And, you know, so we have a couple other options to go with the surf, you know, just to kind of get them more of the East Coast experience, some additional options that are available if they want. And yeah, it sounds like the banquet's going to be really great. And the venue is just a beautiful place that the seminar is going to be. And people that come, they're going to, we're going to get a seminar on Friday night with a goodie bag with some of the stuff that you need to fish. And then the rods and reels and everything are provided. And um, you and Eddie are out there and the, the, you know, you guys are the ones that know it. I mean, I wouldn't have a clue where to get started. That's why I'm excited to take it too. It, Cause my daughter lives in Boston. So now when I go out there in the future, I can time my trips around the best timing to go and take my stuff and be able to know what I'm doing when I go give it a try. Well, and you know, you mentioned that woman that lives in Boston. Um, this will be really beneficial for her because there's a ton of bass in the Boston area. All of that north and south shore of the city, up by the airport, in the bays, there's tons of bass. And there's surf casting locations. There's great places if she gets in a kayak or you know a small boat. So this will really be a benefit to her because, I mean, if I lived up there, at certain points of the summer, the water is a little bit cooler than it is for us, even though it's only a couple hours away. But bass are hold up there and they i mean right into the winter right into thanksgiving and you know maybe even into december bass are all over the boston area so that's a that'll be a big um learning experience for her awesome yeah my daughter lives on the north shore and i go to several times a year so that that's kind of how why this whole thing got set up you know because i have gone out there and have not had a clue how to fish out there my daughter doesn't fish so this is kind of why the whole thing started and now you know Meeting uh, Mandy from Al's, and she knew you guys, and it's just all coming together perfectly. We think Mandy's the bomb. We love her. Yeah, she's <laughs> awesome. Yeah, she's, yeah, she is the bomb. <laughs> well, Todd, tell us a little bit about you and uh, what you do so people can go check check out. Uh, it's the fish wrap com. Tell us a little bit about that. Uh, I write a weekly newspaper column for a local company that gets distributed to a paper statewide. And because of the, when I first started, I only got the job because everybody that got hired for it would write for two weeks and the striped bass would show up and it all quit. <laughs> so once I started understanding the deadlines of newspapers, I write over a week in advance, which makes fishing reports kind of irrelevant because, you know, a week or seven days later, eight days later, it's old news. The paper job morphed into uh, storytelling and interviewing fishermen and going places and it became more about the people. I mean, there's plenty of fish reports, but so th- that became uh, that became a website, and from that, um, I do uh, two monthly magazine columns about fishing and people who go fishing and places to go, and uh, that's kind of morphed into some other magazines and some freelance work. And I do I just had a piece in Double Gun Journal, which is a Midwestern. Actually, I think he's in Tennessee. Actually, mm. so high end shotguns and field upland bird hunting and. Um, that sort of spiraled. The whole fish trap writer thing has kind of grown and grown over the years. And, um, actually this month, if you have absolutely nothing else to do, <laughs> um, I'm the host of the golf destinations TV show this month, <laughs> huh, which is wow. fun because I, I've, I've never golfed in my life <laughs> <laughs> and I might make that painfully clear. <laughs> I, I, I try to make fun of the very 
opening scenes, I make sure everybody knows I'm a fisherman and I'm not a golfer. In <laughs> fact, when we set the show up with the crew, the guy said, you know, hand me a club. And he said, these are ladies clubs. And I said, I didn't know there were ladies clubs. And he turns the club around the side of it says, ladies. <laughs> I, said, I, didn't, I didn't know women had their own golf clubs. I didn't know. So if you have absolutely nothing to do, you can watch Fox Sports this month and catch the golf destinations television and watch a cool. fisherman make a fool of himself trying to go golfing. <laughs> so awesome. That's basically so basically the, the goal, you know, besides the day job, it's um I manage the fish wrap writer and try to meet as many people. Um this afternoon I'm going to um see the end of a fishing tournament, the uh, kayak fishing tournament for largemouth bass and meet those guys and do interviews with them. So I, I, the whole focus is to introduce viewers and, and readers to the, the fishermen, the people that go fishing and the characters that I meet, which is, I feel very blessed to have met the people that I have and whatever level of success I've, I've managed to eke out of this. I've gotten to meet a lot of good people like Jeff and Mandy and now you do. Oh yeah. That's and Bob, just so you know, when, when I, when Mandy first told me about this months ago, I came over to tell my wife and I said, I, I told about the weekend and, and you and I said, I cannot remember this woman's last name. I'm so bad. And we typed in, Barb, Wisconsin fishing, and your name came right up. <laughs> so talk about fame. Well, yeah, right. Well, thank you so much for taking some time to tell us a little bit about Stripers and what people are going to be, what they should expect for this event. And we, like we said, are super pumped. I hope that some people listening to this check out the, the link to sign up, read more about it. And even if you're in the area, make it a lot easier for you to, um, you know, get there and, and all that. And it sounds like it would be super beneficial for anyone in that area to attend. So. It will, and they just they. The bottom line is, it's it's exciting. Striper fishing is really exciting. There's a little bit of knowledge, you know, a little bit of skill to figure out where the fish are or what the conditions are. Looking for some bait, and looking for nervous water, or you know, the right birds. But when it comes together, it's really really exciting. And you get a five or ten pound um, striper on the other end of the line that's not interested in meeting you. <laughs> it's a lot of fun, especially on a long rod and standing in the water. It's a lot of fun. We're gonna have a blast. I might not be able to sleep now between now and then. <laughs> <laughs> well, I promise. And Eddie's a total character. So yeah, we hear he's he's super fun. So excellent. I can't wait to meet you two. It'll be um it'll be a real thrill for me to meet both of you. Yep, I'm excited too. I'm gonna go home and uh, get my uh, surf rod out and my waders and start packing. <laughs> excellent. Actually, yeah, it's only a few weeks away. We're going to have uh, a ton of fun, and everybody's going to learn a lot. You get to stand around the water and meet a couple of knuckleheads like me and Eddie, and <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll, we'll have a blast, I promise. We'll have a blast. Well, if you're anything like me, you're racing over to wiwomenfish.com slash events right now to check out the Striper Fishing Clinic and get signed up because what an opportunity of a lifetime to fish with Eddie and Todd and go after these Atlantic Striper. It's going to be super, super fun. So go check that out. And uh, of course, as always, we've got links in our show notes, some photos and stuff like that. So go on over to thewomanangler.com slash 77 and check that out as well. And then stay tuned for next week. I know we got a lot of women who listen to the show who, uh, you know, not everybody is into fishing and, uh, or you're into fishing, but you're also, you also love to hunt. So we want to make sure that we provide that content for you as well. We've got some really cool opportunities here coming up to get some hunting coverage in. And uh, our plan is for next week to share some of that with you. So hopefully that all works out, but definitely come back here next week. Either way, it's going to be a great episode. Thanks for listening. Thanks for subscribing and sharing these episodes. We appreciate each and every one of you. Thanks. <laughs>